Hi everyone, here's the Bookchemist once again. Today I'm reviewing one of my favorite horror novels of all times, The House on the Borderland by William Hope Hudson, which should be much more widely read than it currently is. If you've never heard of it, if you've never read it, by all means go and read it immediately if you're a horror fan. I reread it recently and I thought I would share some of my, my thoughts and the reason why I think it's such a great novel, even though it's kind of annoying and at times it's utterly and impossibly boring. House on the Borderland presents a wonderful, magnificent use of a double frame narrative where the main events of the book happen inside a narrative, inside a found manuscript that some of the characters comment on in the frame narrative, which itself is framed in an editor's note. All of this creates a beautiful sense of suspense and the feeling that the events you're reading about, because they're separated by you, because they went through so many curate curator's consciousness, their impact is all the more powerful. A similar thing happens in House of Leaves by Mark Danielewski, easily the scariest book I've ever read, where the fact that the strange narrative you're reading about has been curated by someone who admits to well, to the fact that this narrative kind of took their sanity away for a while, that makes it all the more powerful, I believe. The House on the Borderland also features some of the scariest scenes I've ever encountered. The moment early in the book, still in the frame narrative, where Tonizon and Beregnog, by the way, Tonizon and Beregnog, the, the names are ridiculous enough, uh, 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 and they, uh, they show a, a, a wonderful lesson, which is, all horror needs a tiny bit of humor. You you always need a bit of humor. It's it's like those white backgrounds where you just have a speck of black and that makes the white stand out more. The humor makes the scare stand out even more. But I was saying when Tonizon and Beregnok are running in the uh, in the woods around the the ruins, and they're chased by something. Are in, are they even chased by something? Aren't they? Who knows? It's one of the scariest, most tense scenes I've ever encountered. And still it pales, of course, when those pig creatures appear. Oh, the pig creatures, if you haven't read the book, you're in for some serious scares. Um, the attack of the pig creatures, I would say, again, a classic in all of horror fiction. There's no other way to, to define it, if not as a wonderful, beautiful piece of narrative, perfectly capturing such a difficult... A set of feelings and circumstances as the the horror and the anxiety and the terror are of confronting a supernatural attack in a place of immense solitude. House on the Borderland is far from flawless and it's one of those rough diamonds, it's one of those novels that I adore even though oh my god some parts of it just make me mad they're so uh, clunkily and clumsily written. Uh, most of H.P. Lovecraft, who is arguably uh, one of my favorite writers, <laughs> gives me the same feeling. The problem with horror in general, I believe, is that it's all nice and good so long as you're building up the mysteries. But when it comes to solving them or to try and give them some sort of logical explanation, that's when the wheels start coming off from the whole enterprise. That's the reason why many of the greatest horror narratives of all times um, fail exactly when that part of the equation comes into play. The Whisperer in Darkness by H.P. Lovecraft is one of the scariest, one of the most beautiful, eerie, disconcerting narratives ever in its first half. When you're getting to know about this person living alone in the Vermont woods, besieged by alien creatures whose intents are beyond our understanding. But then the second half where the action happens, it just it's just plain stupid. Similarly, Stephen King's It is a wonderful, fantastic novel capturing that feeling of um, that fear of unknown that takes hold of you as a kid when you're confronted with the mysteries and the horror of the world, both the actual world we live in and in the novel's case these supernatural occurrences, but I am still to find anyone, and please let me know if you are that person, I'm still to find anyone who believes that it's second part, both the literal second half of the book and the, the narrative that's set once the characters have grown up, 
I, I'm still, I still have to find anyone who believes that part of the book holds up to the first part. The resolution of the events holds up to all the expectations that was built up by uh, earlier into the book. And that's very similar to what happens in the house on the borderland. Once the character starts getting a little bit Indiana Jones, a little bit scholarly and tries to squeeze an explanation out of the events, I think the novel gets a tiny bit boring, which is nothing compared to the cosmic horror sections in the second half of the book, when the character's consciousness travels to Yugoth or wherever it goes. Now, I'm probably too harsh because I must admit that the cosmic horror sections where the narrator's consciousness travels through the outer reaches of space and time, they are in a way a virtuosistic writerly performance, or at least an attempt at one, an attempt at representing something that the human mind can hardly even grasp, let alone put into words. In that sense, they reminded me a lot of The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by H.P. Lovecraft, an oniric adventure through the dreamlands, which is both awesome in its scope in what it wants to, attend, uh, to attempt, and, well, most of the time, kind of very boring. The risk there, and believe it or not, I say this as a huge fan of the Dream Quest of a Noble Kadath, is the same risk in The House on the Borderland in its second half, which is that following the narrator's um, fantasies and, and dreamscapes all the way through, it feels very self-indulgent. It feels a bit solipsistic even on the narrator's part to be sharing all of these psychedelic visions one after another. Perhaps you just have to be on shrooms when you read these sections. Perhaps that's the trick. I've been told in the past that that's the way you should read Gravity's Rainbow. Perhaps that's the way you should read House on the Borderland and Lovecraft 2. I've picked up two things during my rereading of the novel, which I'm not sure I noticed too much the first time round, which I'll remark on. The first is not a very good one, the second is a very, 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 very good one. Um, the first one is that I believe the narrator's reasons for sticking with the house and staying there even once it's besieged by swinish monsters, and the personal element that, 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 that is introduced in the narrative, the narrator's obvious connection with this woman he loved, feels a little bit too on the nose and not very believable because the narrator is otherwise an unlikable curmudgeon. And this love narrative that's inserted in The House on the Borderland makes him look a little bit like young Werther from Goethe's novel. I didn't find that very believable. The other thing I noticed is how, what an important, what a crucial role the narrator's sister plays into the book. The narrator's sister and her reaction to the events and her take on them. I won't comment on it too much because I think you should get to, well, the conclusion I reached by yourself and tell me if we reach the same one somehow to understand what I'm talking about, let's just say that I think the sister's perspective on the events cast the entire narrative under a light of doubt that feels almost like a fourth narrative within all the other frame narratives, almost as if the sister's, uh, the story of the sister's reaction to the, these events is the actual story that went out in the friggin' house on the borderland and you just have to look for it within her brother's narrative. Does that even make sense? I feel like this is a classic review where I just blubber on about a book I'm enthusiastic about, and I make no sense, but I hope I conveyed uh, my passion for The House on the Borderland, how I think every fan of fantasy, fantastical, supernatural um, fiction, horror fiction, should absolutely read it once in their lifetime. And please bear with me uh, a little bit like when I talk about Lovecraft, if I sound uh, grumpy and I sound like I dislike so many things about the book, it's just because I love it so much, I get mad at it for not being even better. I think we we often do this with, um, with the fiction, with the art we are passionate about, so take it as a good sign and take it as a sign that the book should absolutely be read. Let me know what you thought about The House on the Borderland and uh, I actually never read anything else by William Hope Hudson, so let me know if the rest of his oeuvre is as deserving as The House on the Borderland. I'm really curious to hear from you guys in the comments section. Thank you as always. Bye guys.